morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lord Gabi here, your host on Revival Form Radio, doing our live talk program covering motivation on this, your Monday morning rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, I'm looking at a topic, guidelines, ideas for the strong take taking care of the weak, for the strong uh, taking care of the weak. So welcome again. Hopefully you had a blessed night rest, you had a blessed weekend, you're ready to take on the challenges of this work week. Let us pray. Our Father, Lord, and heaven, I thank you for the blessings of this day, for the blessings of your word. Pray to me, be with us, dear Lord, as we study and figure out how best to live in this life and how to move and have our beings. May you bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. So I want to share with you some guidelines and ideas for the strong to take care of the weak. So some guidelines and ideas for the strong to take care of the weak. So uh, in various different times in life, we are in positions where we are um, the strong. You know, it's automatic. If you have a child, you are the strong. You're the bigger person, as they say, in the room. And um, this has been a thought in my mind, especially as we look at some of the things that goes on with wars, that how do you deal with this thing? And then as you study the Bible, you find that God is always in the position of the strong. And um, some of the guidelines and methods of how we approach um, taking care of the week. So I wanted to explore that today and um, think for the rest of the week, I'm going to try to explore this thought of the guidelines of how the strong take care of the week because it's a very fascinating and puzzling uh, thing to deal with because um, one ought to love and care and cherish for those that you are in charge of or those that you have power over or if you just have power and you have the, they have the ability in your hand to bless, how do you exercise that? Because when it's in your, the power of the hand, as the Bible says, to bless, then it becomes very difficult because often people want to abuse that blessing. And you have the blessing and you have to make sure that you use the right way. So the weak should be cared for and protected. So that's a given. It's the right way. We don't believe in evolution. We don't believe in the survival of the fittest. We believe that the strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak. The strong are to bless those that are in a weaker position, not to destroy them and eat them. We're not wild animals. So we believe uh, from what we are as human beings, humanity, uh, and from what God put inside of us, is that we are supposed to take care and protect those that are weak. Yet we find that kindness will be abused and is viewed as weakness. So you are in a stronger position, and if you are kind to a person, this very strange um, uh, situation happened over and over again. It happened with people in the society. It happens amongst nations. It happens in family. That if you're in the strength position and you show kindness, love, mercy, that is uh, viewed um, by people often as being weak, weakness. So how do you do with that? So this is this aspect I wanted to explore Firstly here, um, with this thing I'm going to be trying to deal with, how do you deal with this weakness? So we explore how God's methods or God methods of taking care of those that are weak uh, is not ruining love. So God's method, the way of God's approach it, this is where one of the, 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 the confusion comes in the Bible and sometimes it seems that is an, a, one of the issues that comes up as a contradiction or hard to understand. And that is how God deals with this um, idea here of not blessing people being a kind God that is given, but still dealing with people who will take a blessing and use it as a curse. You, you can know when somebody's going to trip up when they do very well. You know, the more money, more problems more success is the more it gets the people ahead and they start to do crazy things and even abuse others and forget where they came from. So this balance is important to meditate upon. God's method of taking care of those that are weak uh, is not ruining love. So when you read the Bible, somebody say, well, even they, it's hard for them to sometimes see love in the Old Testament. But you go to the New Testament, nothing changed. In this life, you're never, because Christ's death upon the cross never stopped murder and bloodshed things continue to so to speak the way they always were or are so the methods continue the same way so we explore 
how God's method of taking care of those that are weak is not ruining love. So it's the same thing we deal with the family. If you have children, uh, most of the destruction and the mess that happened to children is not per se the abuse, but it's often, you know, the parent loving a child to death, literally. And a child's going to die of some drug overdose or die of some eating disorder or die of bad behavior or go to prison. And it can be put at the feet of the parent because the parent loved the child to death. So how do we do it the way Christ do it and be blessed? Uh, the other thing that I've been thinking about is, as I say uh, before, the wars. Uh, how do you avoid, avoid war? And this is something that, you know, I've thought about often. Because one of the ways to avoid war is actually to use force. It, it is a, a Force is also a prevention. A, milita a standing military can be uh, a bad thing. It can be very draining the resources, but it also can be a good thing. It can deter people. Who knows that if they come, they're going to get to whooping. So his methods do not create weak, emotional, spoiled brats or miserable individuals. So if you look at God's method, if you follow God's method, the end result is you don't get people who are weak because you're ministering and protecting the weak, but you don't try to, you're not trying to create dependency. Um, you're not trying to create addicts. You're trying to create people who can stand in the image of God. You don't create emotional people. You don't create people who are spoiled brats or you don't create miserable individuals. You know this, um, Andrew, I make this famous statement where, or it's famous in my mind where uh, she says, if you notice the most miserable children are the most petted children. And it never fails. The most miserable children are the most petted children. It never fails because somehow, instead of it making a person tougher, the parent is doing one thing and getting the wrong outcome. And it's the same thing in just about any relationship. The relationships that goes that way are always the worst. Uh, notice the prophets were always more righteous. They lived very clean lives, but they were always very tough. Uh, they had a hard ex exterior and an interior uh, because that's the, what it is. It, you, you know, you don't create a diamond without some type of pressure. So this is part of the reality of life. So how to do this is some things I want to explore because as... The question always comes up, so how do you avoid not being beaten up? Because remember, Christ says we have to be wise as serpent and harmless as doves. So a dove is very, um, you know, at risk all the time because their defenses are not just not there. They're not an eagle. But yet God says, well, I don't want you to be like that. You know, as a matter of fact, doves always find it fascinating. They'll, they'll be on the road. And they'll be the last bird to get out of the way. Or they'll be somewhere and all of a sudden it seems like they realize when it's too late sometimes that they're going to get run over. And yet most birds will get out of the way. So there is like very um, need of protection. But we're not called just to be doves. We're called to be um, like snakes. And snakes uh, will come upon you from the back and they'll wrap you up and choke you to death. So there's this element that you see even in Christ's teaching that you can pull away from the death of Christ that Christ made us to be foolish but Christ laid down his life that was his intent but he still tells us that I'm sending you in in Matthew chapter 10 he says I send you in amongst criminals amongst murderers amongst the worst of the worst and I'm sending you in there to try to convert them I'm sending you there to do what they don't want and this is one of the hardest things about ministry is like when you think about it you are sent in and uh, to try to convince the enemy to, to flip in the enemy territory. And he says, you know, you, you would run into a situation where the people persecute you. So he says, because of this, I want you to be harmless. You're not here, there to hurt others, but you have to be slick. You have to be wise as a serpent. You have to be able to use your head because I'm not sending you in there to just go get yourself killed. But that could happen. So because of the risk that you run, you have to be able to follow some guidelines. So I want to explore some of that this week. I just want to lay that out to you where I'm going. I want to explore some of that because this is the most fascinating and difficult thing to me to deal with, to get that balance. And that balance is not easy because you, 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 you flip back and forth. This is what we are as human beings in all issue. You can go too much on the side of mercy, too much on the side of, 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 um, 
of justice and there's a balance somewhere that has to be gotten and most naturally God who is the all-knowing God who is perfect he has that balance so we study to understand how he does things and you see in God you 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 can if you preach Christ as very mamby pamby you're not truthful and if you preach him as being all terror you're not truthful there's some truth in there in both aspects so we want to have both and this is why we explore now in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 Proverbs 18 verse 10 it says the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run it into it and is safe the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run it into it and is safe so the Lord protects us he's a strong tower the mere fact this language of strong tower uh, signify that there's a war and that's an important thing for us to have going on in our mind you know the bible says the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking who he may be he may destroy so you when you approach life and you know this is motivation here when you approach life and the first thing you have to learn is that we are at war and so when you're at war it is just what it is and so you know you run into a strong tower for protection so you have to have your protection you have to have your defenses that's why the lord says you have to be wise as a serpent you you're not there to hurt others but you're there to protect yourself also you're trying to live the other day to preach another day you know you want to preach today but you want to live to preach another day that's important and so the lord is a strong tower we run because there's evil outside and you have that in your mind. The average person there do not think like that. So when you think about why you we do something like this, why spend time trying to understand what's going on in the health industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the war industry, the every industry, what's going on in the medical field and the um, the the judicial field, all that stuff, is because you want to know what the enemy is doing. Because the devil is not necessarily coming as a enemy in clear broad day uses the system the bible said we rest not against flesh and blood but against principality and power in high places so there is systems in place that evil doors have been working on behalf of the devil to hurt you and i so when you approach life like this it makes you be on your toes do you always are you always on your toes yeah you gotta always be on your toe there's a war that's what the bible tells us but the war is not seem is not seem like it's you can't see it. It's not very clear. It's you fighting a three-dimensional. Uh, you fight. You're in a three-dimensional world, but there's a fourth dimension to the world, and you're fighting that war. And there's a spiritual side to everything. There's a deeper, darker, sinister. And so you be careful. What you eat, what you put in your mouth, so to speak, where you lay, what you lay on, where you live, and all that stuff. I was seeing the headline news. I didn't click it, but I saw where this. This couple, they say, from Florida find out that the land that they own used to be a dump. You know, people do that. They'll sell you nonsense. And you got to be careful. You have to do a little homework. But if you approach life like that, then somebody say, well, you're approaching life like life, life is a war. It is a war. It might not be bombs dropping, but there's other wars going on. So we run to the Lord because it's a strong tower. So this is the guideline that you got to know. You know, as I said, where's your safe zone? Where's your safe spot? If you don't know this, then when the enemy is throwing darts at you, fire darts, you don't have a tower to run to. So you're going to run into problems. So you got to know this. This is part of life. You know, there's diseases, there's stuff. So somebody will be taking extra precaution. And then another person who don't believe this, they leave themselves careless and up to abuse. You know, it's always fascinating when I see like um, or hear reports of young girls that will drink until they're pace to the floor and then they get raped and the rapists need to be treated as somebody that take advantage of somebody that's drunk but i'm just saying it is fascinating how somebody could not believe or not have this concept that you have to be in your sober state you have to be aware of your surrounding you have to be in control as you'll be abused uh i don't think it's really the person is trusting i just think the person is foolish and it, it is it is still important to deal with the criminals that do wrong but you got to be careful of your surrounding you got to be careful of where you at how you just lay yourself careless that you know you, you don't know that people out there want to rape you and so it's fascinating and it's it's it doesn't take away from the the you know it is 
you know, some people say you can't blame the victim, but the you know, you don't listen to that as a Christian. You know, you don't listen to that. You don't put yourself in situation like foolish people or idiots who say you don't blame the victim, and then you put yourself in a situation that you're gonna be the victim. Blaming the victim or not, don't make you dumb. You don't drink yourself until you're on the floor, and you think you're gonna be safe, and somebody's gonna be look at the day they're gonna take advantage of you and abuse you. So, so much of that happened and even happened to males. I've heard males do the same thing and get raped by other males. It's weird how this life can be. And so you need to be in your mind. But you go about life knowing that you need to have a safe space. Notice in Romans 15 verse 1, 2, and 3. Romans 15 verse 1, 2, and 3. It says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor. For is good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. So we that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak. It's what a clear principle you see in the scripture. And it can be clear in the in the nature, but I know what what many people do, including Darwin, he that he took the principles and he basically look at certain extremes in nature and he says this justify man's domination of the weak. But we don't believe this. We believe that we that are strong ought to be an infirmities of the weak. But the problem with the struggle in life with humanity is that when people see that you're weak or think that you're weak, they tend to want to take advantage of you. They want to abuse you or they want to disrespect you. So this is where this idea comes from in my mind. Like, what am I thinking here? Because we that are strong are the bearded infirmities of the weak. But I've been in many situations that when you're nice to a person, the person gets like a light bulb go off in their mind and they're like, aha, this is a fool. We can abuse this fool. So then it get me thinking. And so if I'm supposed to take care of the weak, so I have to approach it in a certain way that the weak know that I'm there to take care of them. But they also have to be reminded that they are weak and they are in need of help. And um, I'm doing this out of the kind of my art, but I'm not a pushover or a fool. I'm still a snake and you might get bite. That's still part of the reality. But in my dealings, I'm a dove. But I'm still taught to be a snake also. So it's important because this thing here is often abuse. And you know, just like with God, God deals this way because God's mercy and love is often abuse. But yet the Bible shows us very clearly from Genesis to Revelation that God deals with sinners. God will wipe sinners out. Like don't mess about. And he's our heavenly father. And that's why I think he's, that character is so beautiful because that's how a father is supposed to be. A father is supposed to enforce rules. And at the end of the day, that's part of the job. So we then that are strong are to help the weak. It's the same thing. You look at one group of people who are stronger, beating up another group of people that are weaker. It's not, it's not anything to celebrate. It is barbaric. But at the end of the day, sometimes you have people that are weaker. Don't play fair. And so you have to step in and do what you have to do. So this creates a lot of problem in life. So I think, you know, as I say, the nuclear option is never a bad thing. Not necessarily something to use, but it's the idea that it ought to be there for good reasons. And people need to know that you'll use it. Because if they don't know you'll use it, they'll step out of line. Even people that you love and people that love you. But they'll still step out of line because they'll think they can disrespect. And it's just to create an environment where... You know, as I said, we just have this thing here to keep us honest. You know, that that's how they normally say with certain security measures, right? You know, this is just here to keep, you, you know, you and I honest. So just in case one of us get dishonest, we start shooting. And this ought to be part of it. This is always part of it. And, you know, it's beautiful to talk freely about this because this is partly how God deals. It is just part of it. Hell never got taken off the table because Jesus Christ died on the cross of the, uh, for our sins. It is just the reality. Uh, hell is always there. Um, a beat down. Uh, the whirlwind comes in our life and just blow everything away. 
And somebody said, but I'm a Christian. How could God allow all this to happen? Sometimes you know, just keep keep everybody honest, as they say. Keep everybody straight. This is part of life. Notice here in Psalm 61, verse 1 through 4. Psalm 61, verse 1 through 4. To the chief musician upon Nigana, a psalm of David. David, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Some protection, right? For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. So notice there, it's important for you to know that they are enemies. And it's also important to know that God will treat us like enemies if we live like enemies. And will protect the weak. This to me is a very important thought when you think about guidelines of how to deal, how to take care of the weak. Because why are you taking care of the weak and those who are oppressed? It is important to remember or to remind those that are being taken care of that there is a guideline or a definition of enemy. And if you start to behave like one, then you're going to be treated like one. So you see, when we deal with God, you see God says, this is how I treat the enemy. You can see that very outlined like in the book of Deuteronomy. God said to Israel, this is how the people of the land behave, the Canaanites, which include the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and so forth, the Gergesites, and so forth. So this is how they behave. And because of this behavior, I'm going to treat them a certain way because they're living like enemies, and they're abusing people. They're abusing the animals also. So I'm going I'm to treat them a certain way. But you are going to replace them. But if you start to behave like enemies and start to act crazy and abuse the fatherless, the widow, the stranger, uh, those that are weak and oppress people, then I'm going to start treat you like how I treat them because that's their behavior. And I'm going to treat you. I'm not, God is not, as the Bible says, God doesn't change it and God is not partial. God does not favor or look upon the statue of somebody and say, I'm going to treat you different from the other. So, God says, if you behave like an enemy, then I'm going to react to you like an enemy. But this is how a friend behave. So if you behave like a friend, I'm going to treat you like a friend. Now if you become a friend of me, I'm going to treat you like an enemy. So this is why it's important for us to understand this. And to have this as a guideline also when we deal with others. That there is a treatment that we give to enemies. It just that's what it, you cannot treat everybody as if they are friends because somebody's trying to poison you is not your friend. Somebody's trying to destroy you is not your friend. And then the friend, how can you think about it, how can you treat your friend the same way you treat your enemy? And how can you treat your enemy the same way you treat your friend? Well, what's the point of being a friend or an enemy to you? Well, there's probably a point to be an enemy, but there's no point to be a friend. And there's people I know that they seem like even their friends are treated terrible. So that should be taken off the table, right? You you should treat your friends like they're friends. But your enemy ought to know that this is the treatment. Now, if your enemy start to behave like a friend, then you treat your enemy like a friend. You see, it's not so much the, the, the how you say, it's more the behavior that dictates treatment. Because that's how God deals. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whomsoever that believe. It's not everybody that believes. And so the Lord made the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. But at the end of the day, curse be upon the people that does not obey the word of the Lord. Mercy is always offered, but beatdowns come because beatdowns come primarily because of the lifestyle. And so if a person act like an enemy, they're going to be treated like an enemy. You see, the, when you think about the antediluvian world that got the flood, you know, all the enemies... We're going to be outside the boat and all the friends were going to be inside the boat. It was a simple choice. Somebody said, what's that choice? It's a simple choice. Let me explain to you again. All the enemies were outside the boat and all the friends were inside the boat. You make a choice. Where are you going to be? In or out? 
Well, if you're out, you're going to get certain treatment. If you're in, you're going to get certain treatment. And it's the same thing. It's important to note. If you act a certain way, you're going to get a certain be, uh, treatment. Now, it's not good that if somebody act a friend to us, uh, we treat them like an enemy. That's the wrong way. Because that's confusion. And that is, is even more important in our homes. You see, it's important for a child to understand that this is the behavior of a family member. This is the behavior of a friend. If you act like an enemy, then I will treat you like an enemy. But if you act like a friend, then I'll treat you like a friend. It's simple teaching. And this is to me a guideline to take care of the weak. And so, because at the end of the day, the child becomes the weaker point. It's the same way you deal with friends. It's the same way to me we deal with institutions. And so, there should be clear guidelines. And this is something I had to learn. Because I realized that you could be trying to treat everybody equal. And then then what's the motivation and the incentive and then those people who are behaving bad it's almost like you're encouraging them by the name you know you're you're rewarding bad behavior and when you look in the bible up until this day god does not reward bad behavior god said bad behavior is that you shouldn't eat for four people and the person will pray and pray and pray and the the knee replacement surgery the hip replacement surgery the colon cancer all that stuff is coming because they behave in a certain way God says, if you follow me, you are going to have self-control. So the reality is, this is important because, yeah, especially when you deal with sometimes people who are ignorant of these type of things, of these principles, clear messages have to be sent. And if it's not very clear, at least it needs to be demonstrated clear. When you do this, then this is going to be the result. So again, back to that text in verse 3, it says, For thou is a shelter, um, thou has been a shelter for me. And a strong tower from the enemy. So when you look at the enemy, you should say, I'm in the tower, the enemy's outside. I'm being sheltered from the, the, the enemy in the strong tower, because that's what God is. And you should see the difference between the enemy and the friend. And when you look in the Bible, you see this very clearly outlined. These are God's friend, these are God's enemy. You look at the twelve disciples, you know, after Acts, the one that was replaced. You look at the Pharisees and then you see the end result. You read about the destruction of Jerusalem and you saw that the men that that were still alive, that did Christ wrong, you saw what they got. You saw the Christians or you read about the Christians fleeing and they got out of there as friends of God and they didn't get the beat out. And then you say, okay, they they didn't have they thought they have a strong tower, but the strong strong tower got destroyed. And today you can see the ruins of that. As a testimony that these are those who love Jesus, they're in the mountains, they're safe. These are those who hate Jesus and crucifying him, and they got slaughtered. And it becomes very clear. And so if you are a friend, you're outside and you escape. You're an enemy, you stay inside, you get slaughtered. So it sends a very clear message of behavior that you could you could profess or you could even have the name but if you don't act right if you don't behave right if you don't do the things that you ought to do and you act like you're a, a enemy you're here to s sow discord to sow pain and suffering then you're going to be treated that way now again why you know when i think about wars i think about well that's that's the a sad reality of why one has to deter war uh, because if you come if you don't communicate to people that there will be results from their action then they'll behave bad so they need to know that says you know this action will be met with severe punishment and sometimes you have to dole it out and that's why wars never cease because there's always people who want to abuse and they need to understand, well, that behavior will be met with some severity. This is why L.U.I. says this very powerful thought that, you know, if you, in this world, you will always have to have that, that any type of leadership have to have some stern discipline. Because people want to disrespect, people want to make a fool of you, people want to tear you down, people want to forget who you are, what blessing you bring. They become unappreciative. They forget when they were down, you help them. And you know, how often have you seen that? You help a person out and now they start doing a little bit better. They, they start to disrespect you. They start to be unappreciative. So you have to notice going in 
that when you deal with sinners, that that's how sinners will behave. They'll forget what you did for them. You see this with children. You see this with um, family members, friends, people you come in contact with. The kindness is often abused. It's not appreciated. So you got to keep that in mind. So there are enemies. So this is clear from you know Psalm 61. There are enemies. And throughout the Bible you read. And throughout life I'm sure you realize that there's people sometimes. Even your own family members. They are enemies. And if you look at that. God treat them like enemies. So it's often important to know that God himself. Because some people say. You know the God we serve is just love, 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 love. And you're thinking. Which, which Bible they read. They can't read the Bible. Because you come away, God dole out weapons. So you have to treat some people like enemies. If they live like, live like enemies. If they behave like enemies. And so if, if, if you're in your house. And you're fearful of people in your house. Then probably they ought not to be in your house. They're not, they'll, they'll appreciate the blessing. And God does the same thing. That's why we're down here. And that's why we in this world quarantined. Because many of us and the majority of us uh, all of us at one point were enemies so God said I'm going to quarantine you and I'm going to make your life hard and the Bible says the way of the wicked is hard and a, back, a, a, a whip is for the fool back why? because you have to beat the fool until the fool understands you need to stop being a fool some people they oh my life is so hard because you're foolish and that's what it is so again we live, if we live like enemies, then we get treated. So then that's one of the guidelines of dealing with the weak. So when you're approaching somebody that's weak, they have to understand this. That says, yeah, I'm helping you. I'm going to try to help you become strong. But when you become strong, remember, if you behave a certain way, it's going to be a certain result. Because over the years, I've noticed that you help somebody that's weak and then they get cocky. They get disrespectful. You know, it's always fascinating, as I say, someone will come and they learn a certain thing and then they become, they want to educate you. They become a little bit too wise and full of themselves. And then they go and crash and burn. And you're looking at them crash and burn and thinking, you know, you, you need to be humility all the way. So we protect the weak. We protect the weak, but this is never removed. Notice God never remove um, certain things. No matter what people say, oh, but God is love. And they're like, yeah, but hell never get removed. It's always hell. Never get removed. It is ne never something that is taken off the table. It is sad. Uh, God will dole out the whipping. Notice here, God's dealing with after the flood. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 um, through 11, I think. Verse 1 through 9. Notice here, um, God established restraint. All right, no, this is where you're going to get from this. That when God is dealing with human beings, God will always try to mitigate or to limit the rebellion. There's always bounds that are put. And this was something that I had to learn early on, that there's always boundaries, there's always uh, barriers, there's always something that one has to establish. And you establish it in justice and in righteousness moral, morally. And for reasons, you know, it shouldn't be just do what I tell you. You know, it should be reasonable. One should always be reasonable when dealing with the weak. And deal with those who are less, less, you know, that are oppressed. Because, you know, there are certain, there are certain things that has to be maintained that they might not understand. But you got to maintain it. For, you know, there's so many different, whether they be talking about church, family, whatever. Yeah. A child not going to always understand the boundaries that need to be between wife and husband. You know, you can't expect a six-year-old to understand things that even people in the 50s don't understand. <laughs> Some people. So you, you got to maintain that boundary. So how you maintain that boundary and establish those walls and those protection is important. And sometimes you're not going to be able to explain. But these, they're there for reasons, you know. So, But there's families who sometimes believe, you know, we're all one family and then they don't establish certain boundaries and then things bad happen and they wonder why because these certain boundaries were broken down you know there's 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 imaginary boundaries in other words so notice here what happened it says and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of shinar and they dwelt there and they said one to another go let us make brick and burned them thoroughly and they 
add brick for stone and slime a day for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, um, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So here we have the story of what we call Babel, and ultimately later on Babylon, uh, which is where the Lord scattered the people and the language. So today the explanation biblically given for why we have various different languages that the Lord confounded the language and make us not be able to understand others to create boundaries and that's a whole presentation in itself because i've thought much on this that it makes sense what we see as things that divide us and separate us is actually a good thing uh so that we don't to a certain degree unite in rebellion see god wants us to be one but not in rebellion so notice here god does something here that he makes moves and he makes movies the, I don't want to say strategize, but it would be almost that because I think God is instant. So the strategy comes, it just exists because he knows what he's trying to do. And this is what you have to know what you're trying to do because you're making moves for the blessing of a person. See, when you're dealing, you're trying to bless and create peace. And so sometimes the person you're dealing with or the entity don't understand what it is to make peace because human beings are always at war you often think some people they have no peace until they die and you really let's say rest in peace and someone said but their life was horrendous but like don't worry about it they're resting in peace they're sleeping this is the only peace they'll have and this is how often our people live so you create these type of things to be able to limit if if this didn't happen human beings would be so so horrible because they just un unite in in madness Sometimes, you know, you need different cultures and different language and stuff like that where people can not agree with this other group of people. And it's bad sometimes, but it's good because you can go other countries and see where one thing is enshrined up to high heaven and, and you go somewhere else and they're having a good life and they don't enshrine that thing. And then they make you say, well, that thing might not be that important, uh, you know, but if we were all one, then we would all do everything thing the same way right and if it's for evil it could be very terrible so what does that have to do with guidance so when you're dealing sometimes you know this year how god deals in a certain way now as i say i'll be exploring this concept more as i go on but i'm fascinated about this one aspect of it that how god deals god will strategize god will make moves and god will make sure that they don't unite against him for their own bad because if they had if he had work man they would have they would have gone gone destroyed himself hey they would have just keep going 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 this is you know some people um are against anything to be independent or to be independent atom and stuff like that you know th there's a reason for it because when god breaks stuff up he breaks it up to preserve souls alive he's not doing it because that's what he wants to do is against him god is about unity but sometimes he has to break off something to protect, you know, the church in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness for 1,260 years. It's not God wanting to break the church up. It is to preserve souls alive. It's to save some souls. It's not his intention. That day, maybe one was always the aim, not in rebellion. So all, all throughout millennia, uh, various different millennia, um, or millennia, the the... The issue was always unity, but because of man's rebellion, trying to do towers of Babel, human beings always been doing towers of Babel, spiritual and physical. That's why in the Bible, Revelation 6, 18, 
uh, the fallen church is called Babel. The last conglomerate is called Babel. They join together to build a Babel, but a spiritual Babel. And it's the same Babylon. Uh, it, it is it is there that they're trying to do because they're rebelling against God in unity. So keep that in mind. There's a whole study on that. So notice here now that they built a tower. And uh, another point I wanted to make, which is another side note. You know, that you run into these people, like people call themselves Hebrew Israelites, and they say, well, everybody comes from um, Africa. You know, that's what they will say. But notice here the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that they come from the, the, the plain of Shinar. All right, so they come from the place of the plain of Shinar, uh, and it's in Babel, it's in more Iraq, Iran, that area. And then from thence, they scatter the face of the earth. Uh, so this is, and all the, the tribes came out of um, Noah, and and that's, you know, how the Bible teaches it. Now, other people teach other stuff, but the Bible just simply say we come from over that part of the world, and then we scatter upon the face of the earth. And the people comes out of there. Uh, not much thought to that, you know, right? It's just simple. But people try to confuse it. Um, and I think some of that confusion really, I think, comes from Darwin because he was trying to prove that everybody came from Africa and then evolved to Europe. And I think somehow, somewhere, some along that line. But if you look at even the Bible description of the Garden of Eden, you know, the Garden of Eden starts in Northern Africa, somewhere along, somewhere in the Middle East, Northern Africa. That's the Garden of Eden. The Nile is described, the, the Tigris, the, you know, those rivers are all described. So you see that it's one big general area that is the hotbed of the world to, to this day. Uh, just important note, this is the, the, the center point of the world from God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and the Bible says Jerusalem, Israel is the center point of the world. world. And if you look at the map, it seems very logical where most of the population of the world live. It seem that seem to be it's always the hotbed. And look at what's going on right now. All the armies of the world are in that area right now to kill each other. Side note. So notice here that this that's part of my thinking. Because part of my thinking is as I'm looking at these wars being fought uh, between the Kurds and the Turks and America and Russia and Syria and Iran and Iraq and wow, you know, it's literally like the same area that just get des described is where this thought coming from because it, the whole idea, you know, you think about how to protect and part of how to protect is that you have to make sure people know that there will be war. But then you look at these wars, you're thinking these people have been fighting from where we're just reading and here we are we're close to the end of time and they're still fighting it is being just a place of bloodshed and you can read about it in the bible and you, you turn to your news and you're thinking aren't these all the countries that been fighting forever <laughs> in in wars and you could see a video and you see this tank going on the road and you see an american flag and be like every country is represented this is unreal it's like you're reading the bible so back to our presentation, but as the, uh, in the week, you'll see how this all unfolds in my brain because this is how I'm seeing it. It's like it, it is we are still in that place and that time. But remember, all this was going on. I kept on thinking that Abraham, he got involved because remember because of Sodom, he got involved with because his nephew lived in Sodom. He got involved with war himself, and. He, he, a man of God, was involved with this type of thinking. So if you hear me talking about this, you're wondering, why do you, do I have to talk about this stuff? Look, Abraham had to deal with it. He's the father of the faithful God. And Christ had to deal with it. Uh, it, it he came and he, a violence was put upon him. It, we're never going to ignore this topic. This is just part of topic. When you're in a home, uh, it's part of the topic. You know, you see what's going on with these young kids killing their family member, wiping them out. It's, it's part of this topic. It has to be known that you will deal and will deal like how God deals. <laughs> Can't you read in James chapter 4, verse 7 through 8? James chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. Here we read, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, your, ye sinners, and purify your heart, ye double-minded. So, some people believe that you can have a 
I don't, I don't even know what they believe because they believe so much craziness. Uh, but sometimes they believe this idea that it seemed like, you know, they said the, the, the Lord used a donkey in the time of um, Be, um, Balak, um, Balaam and Balak. Balaam, the messenger of God, was riding on a donkey and God used the donkey so God can use an body. And they don't understand, God didn't convert the donkey. Um, or the Lord didn't say save the donkey. The Lord was trying to save the the sinner, which is Balaam, which was to be a messenger or prophet of the Lord. So that's interesting. So notice here the Bible gives it still is different. Like what I'm saying. You draw an eye to me, I draw an eye to you. The Lord says, you cleanse your hand, I'll bless you. I'll continue to bless you. You gotta wash your hand. And you purify your heart and stop being double-minded. Make up your mind that you're gonna serve the Lord and I'll bless you. It's very clear. Say so you um, submit yourself to God and you resist the devil and the devil will flee from you, right? So some people, they have the devils and the devils are overcoming them. Or their demon is overcoming them. And the problem is they're not submitting themselves to God. They're not resisting the devil. But they expect the devils to leave them. You have to make an effort. You got to put your two cents in there. You can't just expect God to do everything. And it's the same thing to me in relationships. You know, it doesn't change in a relationship. You give something, you expect to receive something. It is only fair. What's the point of having a relationship where it's only one-sided? It's not a relationship that's either stalking or you being abused. That's not a relationship where you're giving and not receiving. A relationship is what it is. It's a relationship. Or unless unless it's a, a, a dysfunctional relationship, so the God is is no uh, pushover. God knows what's going on, and so the Bible makes it very clear that yes, God knows you exist, and God can bless you to a certain degree, or will bless you to a certain degree. But if you want a powerful relationship with a God, you have to do your part, because God is already doing His part. He draws you, He calls you, He blesses you, He gives you rewards for even what you didn't do unmerited reward but you now have to submit to him you have to resist the devil you have to make some effort and then God says I'll deliver and the devil will flee from you because you're like you're a waste of time that's what the devil will see you as but there's many people who claim to be Christian and the devil don't see them as a waste of time because the devil have them like a puppeteer have a puppet it's just basically making a fool of them because they're not resisting. They make no effort. You know, the devil's going to go to an easier prey. Remember, uh, the lion is looking for something weak, something diseased, and stuff like that. Looking for easy pick pickings. So you shouldn't make yourself be an easy picking. The devil, yes, he goes around as a roaring lion. But if he roars and you resist that and you flee that, you show that you can, you'll fight back, you'll run, you'll do whatever. Then the devil will be like, you know what I mean? What's the point? I have, I have this person over here I can eat. And they go over there and eat what is, what is that easy prey. You make yourself so easy. But it's the same thing when you're dealing with something that is weak. It's important for this idea to be there. That the person who is weak, if you're helping somebody that need physical health, they need financial health, help, they need some type of other help, then they have to live by this principle also. And you have to know that you cannot bend over backwards, so to speak, and they're not bending over backwards. It's the same principle. It doesn't change. And as we go through this week, I'll show you it is very rock solid. You submit yourself, therefore, to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Somebody want help and they're not making any effort. They're wasting your time. So when I say guidelines and ideas to the, for the strong to take care of the weak, you got to know as a person, if you're in a position of strength, that the weak ought to behave as if they're trying to resist. That's what's the point of you helping. They're wasting your time. Notice verse 8 says, Draw a knight to God and he will draw a knight to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Because that's your part. When you do that, then the person can make up the rest. You know, I always say, if you have $10 and you need 15 you shouldn't come to me and ask me for lend you 20 You should have said to me, Lloyd, I have 10 I need 15 and I need 5 from you to make up the 15 And I say, okay, I'll give you the 5 But there's people who want to 
get the 15, 100% from you, and they get an extra five also. So they say, oh, you know, this is my scenario. And the scenario is true. They're in a situation. They lay out the situation to you. And then you, you say, okay, so I see you, you, you're in a bind here. And they say, you give me 20. I'd be like, wait a minute. I'm going to give you the 15 plus extra five. I'm paying you. This is not charity. This is abuse. See, this is what's going on here. See, when God deals with us, God doesn't, number one, he doesn't answer our prayers immediately. And we, we, we often get what we need. Now, sometimes you'll give us the desires of our heart. But many times we find we don't even get the desires of our heart. How many people I know are Christians and they, they, how many often they can tell me they get the desires of their heart? Sometimes, sometimes they don't. Because that could ruin the person. See, so God blesses us, but God will limit sometimes even what we desire because he you know desires could destroy us. So draw an eye to God and it will draw an eye. Notice there's principles there. And I've learned over the years, what are you doing charity work? What are you doing uh, preaching? We're doing something. Whatever you're doing is that you can't be more righteous than God. I can't be more righteous than God. We have to approach people similar to how God would approach us and teach us because we got to make them pull their weight. If they can give 50% of the effort, you shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't be put in 100%. Someone say, oh, but you have to love. I've known people and their life is a mess. I've never heard of people. This is what they'll say. People say, well, you know, Jesus went to the furthest, whatever, to save sinners and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. And you watch that person's life. Everybody around them is a mess. Bunch of craziness going on. Because what it is is that they basically want to spoon feed people. You watch a parent that, as I said, they'll lick the lollipop for the child and probably spit the, the lollipop juice out of the, out of their mouth in the child mouth because the child shouldn't even make an effort to lick lollipop because they must spoon feed the child and rub the child and it's so sappy and crazy it's unbelievable but they're just destroying the child so the, the 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 child has to be taught just like what we are taught as christian we got to draw an eye we got to draw an eye also Draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you. I, I thought God only because, you know, there's these people talk about God. It's like he's always chasing after us. And all. It's just so sappy and crazy. You know, if you're chasing, it's the same thing in a relationship. If, you're, if you want to get with a young lady or a woman and you're just doing all the, the drawing eye, you're a stalker. It's unwanted. You're sexually abusing or sexually being overt or whatever. The person that asks you anything person respond to it so why why you keep going you're sick it's a sick you're a sick person when the person when you finally re realize that the person reject you all these people end up killing themselves because you see that their their relationship was weak and sappy the person didn't want it any relationship like that will end in this disaster this is terrible notice here cleanse your hand you sinners and purify your heart you double-minded you want the blessing there's something you need to do Notice here in Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that they, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Satan wanted to destroy all of us. Not just uh, Peter, Satan wanted to sift like wheat. And when you understand that, you know, here, that's why I believe that we have to pray. Because we have to pray that knowing that's the person, you better be careful. You think we're in this game? Satan want to destroy you. And sometimes we have to communicate to those that are weak that this is what you have to know. You got to know that says, look, you better pull up. You know, you, you just can't be there like a blob and expect somebody to always help you and give you handouts and so forth. Man, get up and get going. Because these are some guidelines that you got to know. Because you, you don't know that you, this is a game for your life. And you got to get up. And it don't matter who we're dealing with. Some of our prayers have to pray for somebody because you know devil want to save you. But you know this, Christ didn't just pray for him. Christ says, I'm telling you that I prayed for you because Satan want to destroy you. Sometime in dealings with people or friends or church members, you have to remind them that Satan want to save you like wheat. I'm praying for you. You better pray for yourself. You better shake up your folly ground. Sometimes with our children, you have to remind them. The devil want to destroy. You see what's going on over there? I mean, Ellie says it's so beautiful. She says, 
war is the number one thing. The devil used to sweep multitudes unprepared for hell. Just multitudes end their life in basically just violence and wickedness, executing people, just murdering people. And then they got killed and they die unprepared to meet their maker. That's what war does. And you can see the teeming masses of the world just preparing themselves for war. And so we talk about this thing because, you know, you need to know that says, look, the devil wants to and they're sifting a whole bunch of people right now and killing them. And that's what Satan wanted to do with Simon Peter. He desired him to destroy him, to break him down, to tear him apart, to make him like powder. But Jesus said, I pray for you. See, I pray for people. In Psalms 18, verse 1 through 7, it says here, Psalms 18, verse 1 through 7, it says, this is another guideline I think is important. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. So you know there's enemies. You know that there's a devil. You know they want to, they want to sift you. It's important for, us, for me to tell you and for me to tell myself that it's important to look up to God. Because God is there to protect us. And the devil wants to destroy us. Notice he says, The sorrow of death come past me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrow of hell come past me about, and the snares of death prevent me. See, so when I say guideline here for taking care of the weak, I always have to think about this because, you know, it says like the flood of ungodly men surrounds. Sometimes you're helping a person, and they don't, they, they, as I say, it's important for you to remember and for you to remind them. You see, we're we hooking you up here. We're taking care of you. Out there is a bunch of crazy people. You need to know that. Because sometimes a person will appreciate what you're doing for them and how they're blessing you, how you're blessing them. They're really not in a state to really appreciate it and understand that this is a safe house. This is a safe place. Whether you it's be church, family, whatever, people need to know that. This is safe. Out there is a bunch of crazy going on. Because people can misunderstand it and misunderstand what you're doing for them. Anyhow, I keep reading. It says the sorrow, because I said we're going to explore. This is laying on some basic thoughts here. The sorrow of hell come past me about, and the sinners of death prevented me. In my distress, I call upon the Lord, and he, he cried and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even in his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because of his wrath. So you see the importance there. When we go to God, it, it, God does not make us forget that over there they were trying to take you out and I delivered you. You know, you read through the Bible over and over again. God said to Israel, look, I delivered you. I delivered you. I took care of you. I protected you. You better stay on my side because out there they're waiting to kill you. The devil is wanting to destroy you. Stay with me. And that's important because when a person is in a safe spot and you're helping them, you still have to remember, remember <laughs> before you came, you were whoop, whooped. There's a bunch of crazies out there. And, you know, just, just so you remember. And it's important. As I say, when you deal with children too, it's important. Look, there's some rules here. But out there is abusers. And you might think these rules are harsh, but you better smile. You better be happy. Because you're getting the good treatment here. Out there you're going to get the bad treatment. It's the same thing. You turn from God. You're turning into the world that's going to abuse you. So this is kept before the children of Israel all the time. This is kept before us. We escape the snares of death. We come to Jesus, but we should not become cocky and forget that God blessed us when we were at our worst. And that's often people do. They forget God. And then now they get turned over to the enemy. But God says, I pray for you, Peter, because God, the devil wanted to sift you like wheat, but I pray for you. So there's more I want to talk about because these are some guidelines that I think is important. It's important to deal. It's not, you know, rules must be followed and so forth. But it's like some people need to understand, look, I'm, you're, getting some, you're getting a good treatment. There's worse out there. So some appreciation and some behavior need to be put down for that. Some good behavior. More to talk. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of your word and the blessings of knowing indeed the only true God. I pray that you may bless us, be with us. Uh, we appreciate you, dear Lord, for how you take care of us. 
And we pray by God's grace, by your grace, dear Lord, that we might always show forth our praise, our honor, and the respect that you are more than deserve, deserving of. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow morning where we should talk about the importance of church. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.